Hello, my name is Dr. Brian Reid and I'm a naturopathic doctor and this is a video about the difference in treatment if there is sinus infection in, uh, if there's yeast infection in the sinus uh, versus a, an infection with uh, something called Marcon's which is multiple antibiotic resistant coagulase negative staphylococcus um, aka um, a staph infection in the sinuses that's really, really resistant to antibiotics, um, commonly found in, or semi-commonly found in patients who are dealing with mold illness. So someone had asked a question about this on one of my other videos, and it's a really good question. Um, so is, is the treatment the same? Um, as per usual, nothing that I say should be construed as medical advice. Uh, please talk to your personal healthcare provider before making any healthcare decisions for yourself. Um, and this is just for information purposes only. Um, in my practice, if I have a patient who, oh my goodness, the table's quite messy back there. I usually clean it before I make these videos up. It's my, my big prep, I clean the table and then I hit record. Um, <clears throat> so um, if I had a patient who you know, had a test and it came back showing that there was yeast growing in their sinuses or there was Marcon's in their sinuses or we had reason to believe that there was some other type of overgrowth of something in their sinuses, whether it was strep or maybe the Lyme disease causing bacteria, Borrelia burgdorferi, or was a co-infection or mycoplasma or what have you. Um, in my practice, I would generally be using the same tools regardless of what was overgrowing because the primary tools that I use are essential oils, um, diluted essential oils. Um, again, you should talk to your healthcare provider before uh, working with any treatment, but I know that some folks, you know, they, they do their own biohacking and whatnot, and uh, putting straight essential oils up one's nose is, I believe, a form of torture in some places. So uh, don't, I, I would never do that personally, um, nor would I advise it to anyone. It'd be very, very irritating and painful. Um, but uh, the nice thing with essential oils is that they're just really, really good at killing off uh, microbes that aren't supposed to be there. Um, it's hard to find a study that looks at the killing of, uh, efficacy of essential oils against a wide range of uh, uh, bacteria, yeast, fungus, mold, etc., that doesn't show that it, they're really, really good at killing them off. Now, most of those studies are petri dish studies where the uh, the uh, microorganisms in question are in direct contact with those essential oils at varying concentrations, but the really, I think, uh, clinically relevant link there with sinus related issues is that we can actually spray those diluted essential oils right up the schnoz and actually marinate those microbes in these essential oils. You know, contrasting that to say a study that shows, oh, you know, the Lyme disease bacteria is, you know, easily killed off by, you know, many different essential oils compared to say doxycycline or whatnot. So yeah, those studies exist, but can you get a high enough concentration of those oils in the bloodstream or into the joints where the Lyme bacteria are living, etc.? You know, these are Quite, there's more question marks around that. I mean, granted, essential oils can be very helpful in clinical practice when dealing with Lyme and co-infections, but um, we, we, in my opinion, we can actually more directly extrapolate those petri dish studies looking at essential oils to uh, what we might expect to see in clinical practice, you know, spraying them directly up the nose and bringing them into direct contact with the uh, whatever's growing up the schnoz. So <clears throat> uh, another uh, point to mention here is like, well, how often is yeast um, something that grows up in the sinuses? And based on my clinical experience, um, semi-regularly, uh, we've done nasal swabs and cultures for a number of patients over the course of time, and we do find mold up there on a regular basis, but we actually find yeast up there, I'd say, as regularly, if not more regularly, and sometimes there's both. So it is something that is relevant um, in clinical practice prior to my being more aware of the wild, wacky world of mold toxicity and Marcon's and, and various sinus issues. Um, I had many patients where they had these chronic sinus issues. They've been on lots of antibiotics and this and that, and just they still had chronic sinus issues. And we'd treat them with anti-yeast or antifungal agents and their chronic sinus issues would go away. Um, and then some of those cases didn't get better and it turned out that they had mold issues in hindsight. But it, it is something that is, uh, I, I've seen the clinical application of that, the clinical relevance, relevance of yeast overgrowth in the sinuses many times. Um, I'm at the point in my practice where I, I don't feel like it's terribly important for me to run as many nasal swabs and cultures, you know, sinus swabs and cultures, because if I have 
a reasonable level of clinical suspicion that there's probably something growing in the sinuses, then I know that my treatments are so broad spectrum that I don't necessarily need to know what's overgrowing. It is nice to know, um, but just when I'm chatting with my patients about their options, saying like, well, we could run you know, this and this and this and this test uh, to see exactly what's going on, or we could do a therapeutic trial with some nasal spray and see how that goes. And when we look at the cost of the testing that's involved, then we look at the fact that you know a therapeutic trial with nasal spray is about you know maybe thirty bucks for a two or a three month supply of materials. Um, that's thirty dollars Canadian. That's probably like twenty bucks U.S. these days, just for comparison purposes. Um, it, it can be very attractive to just do a therapeutic trial with the nasal spray. There are other nasal sprays that we sometimes need to use. Sometimes we'll use silver hydrosol nasal sprays. Sometimes uh, we will certainly, in many cases. Um, sort of evolve from just the essential oil nasal spray to a biofilm disrupting nasal spray that has um, something in it called EDTA as a biofilm uh, disruptor. Um, sometimes we'll use nebulizers instead. Um, there, there's another spray we use that has a grapefruit seed extract in it, iodine. Like there's different agents that we can use. It's not just essential oils, but the essential oils generally work very well and that's my, that's my go-to. So I hope that answered the question and if there's any further questions about this topic or anything else, I'll do my best to answer it as soon as I'm able to.